Welcome to GMP The Great, Glorious, and Glamorous, a.k.a. The Going North Podcast, where authors from around the world help you realize that success is tangible. You'll leave with at least one new piece of inspiration or information to help you keep going north every Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Highlight Real Builder for Authors, known as the Going North Podcast, we got another super special, awesome human for you today. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Today's guest in particular, she's actually uh, been published with some of the big folks like Random House and Simon & Schuster, y'all, because this lady right here, she, we got one of those folks with those big brains, y'all, one of them huge brains. I'm talking eight-pack ab type of brains, y'all, because she's a PhD and a scientist, y'all, I'm telling you. That's right. So that means she knows how to use her noodle to get more boodle because today's author in particular, she has quite a few books out there, especially under the urban fantasy type of books that have been bestsellers. And she also loves gaming as well. So let's welcome the one, the only case C herself. And no, it's not Kansas City. The one, the only Christy Cherish. How are you doing today, Christy? I'm doing okay, John. What a flattering introduction, and uh, thank you so much for having me today. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's right, it's the land of cupcakes and self-promotion. Oh, and of course, occasional references to penguins for some reason. Penguins are pretty awesome. Ah, uh, good. All right, so that's the reason. That all makes sense. So it's not about penguins, it's about the special K herself. So mind filling in any cavities I missed about you, Christy? No, I don't think so. I'm, you know, I, I sort of ended up, yeah, science, from the science world, uh, I sort of had a, a weird and wonderful route towards getting into fiction. So uh, sort of a weird way to apply to my science degree. But I, I you know, I love it. It's fun. And uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully I have something useful for you regular listeners. So fingers crossed, but um, yeah. Ah, there you go. That's right. Cross like crisscross indeed. All the jumping. So my goodness, science, being a PhD, turning dissertations into probably novels that have been sold across the globe. How's it feel? I would say, well, the actual, like, I mean, the, the science-y part, um, switching from science into doing the whole, um, uh, you know, writing is, is um, it's a lot of fun. I wouldn't call myself a bestseller by any stretch of the imagination. And I, I certainly wouldn't, you know, I, I think every author kind of considers themselves, um, we're just happy for one reader whenever we get, get a reader, like if, if, the best result I can get and what makes my day, if I have one person really enjoys my book, then that makes my day. Um, you know, I think everybody kind of dreams on getting on those bestsellers lists, but um, they're, you know, that's, a, that's up in the upper echelon there. So I, I, you know, for me, it really is just connecting with, um, it's writing a story that just connects with a handful of people where I managed to bring something to them that they really enjoy. Oh yeah, I definitely say that again because it's like, oh wow, it's like I'm not talking to a wall. It's like I don't have a journal of crazy ideas. I actually have a reader. You're <laughs> right. Oh man, that's a day. I can say that again. Definitely can say that again. Indeed, that's right. Authors love having readers. It makes us look less crazy. <laughs> I don't know I you know I guess there's that part too where you, you kind of write for yourself too I don't think anybody gets into writing um if they don't enjoy putting things on paper I don't know how do you find that yeah there's a part of that too kind of like the classic preacher who 
gets no response from the crowd and they're like all right i guess i'm preaching to myself today and sometimes they still respond it's like up oh, still preach to myself today because sometimes they need to remind ourselves of that hey we can still do it so hey definitely got to have a love for it eventually too at least uh for those who are in it truly for the craft and just for creative expression as opposed to just getting another dollar it's hard making money as a writer like i mean i i i kind of feel like whenever i was going to conferences early on in my writing career and you you know you'd be going to get some advice and, and try and figure out well all right i like writing how do i actually get to the point of being published i found that there was a lot of stuff people glossed over and one of them being that it's it is incredibly hard to make money as as a writer if you get to that point where you can you know you you can get a book out there to a publisher or you do really well in self-publishing then you, you know you've kind of got it made but getting there is really really difficult you know there's you think about how many novels there are out there um, that people want to get out there and into people's hands. Um, yeah, so it's, it's um, you know, that was something when I started off that I kind of wish there had been more information just on how to, what the reality was for being a, for being a novelist and being a professional writer. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. The bill of goods has been sold across the nations all over the globe for years on end. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> uh, if you build it, they might show up. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be lucky if they show up. Yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, you see one random person. It's like, hey, how you doing there, buddy? Want to buy a book? It's shiny. It's glossy. It has characters. <laughs> I, I know bestsellers out there where if one person shows up at a book signing, that is a huge win. I think the number, like even for bestsellers, like, I mean, if you are doing like um, book signings or book readings, you're thrilled if a handful of people show up. Oh, yeah. That's right. It's like, hey, numbers rock every now and then it's good for the ego, you know, not to kill it, but heck, still better than none, because that really puts a damper in the spirits. Like, ah, dang, nobody. Ah, man, like, darn. Like, this multiple personality thing ain't going to work if it's an actual person with multiple personalities, because it's like, oh, there's nobody else in the room. Like, oh, darn, no, there's nobody. It's time to pull out this mirror, talk to the mirror. <laughs> then I have to sign the mirror. <laughs> Uh, but hey, it's not about the mirrors. It's about the power and love of writing. So my goodness. So did you always have this love for writing? And even in the days of you uh, exploring the world of genetics and all the microbiology and all that other good stuff? I really loved um, fiction. So and sci-fi and fantasy. So all throughout my degree, that would kind of be my bus ride in. I'd be reading um well, I had samples going on a microscope uh, because it's all automated. I'd be sitting there reading a book. Um, so I've, I, you know, I was always into that sort of realm of sci-fi, urban fantasy, particularly. Um, but I never wrote. I sort of, you know, I crafted like a lot of people. I'd be walking with my headset, you know, my my, um, I guess headphones at one point, which kind of dates me, but. Um, you know, like the old wire into a Walkman style headphones. Uh, and then, um, you know, eventually, you know, sort of AirPods and stuff, but I'd be writing stories in my head, but I wouldn't be putting them to paper. Uh, and it wasn't until I got partway through almost to the point of finishing up my PhD, where I kind of realized that the next step for me was going to be becoming a professor at a university. And that I, I, I kind of came to the realization that all the fun stuff in the lab, so all the fun genetics, all the fun experimentation, all the stuff I really loved, uh, wasn't going to be the rest of my career. Because when you become a professor, typically you're not doing research in a lab anymore. You're directing it, 
but you're mostly teaching and writing papers and trying to convince the government to give you money to do more of the research for, for the lab. I, and I, I, I realized that wasn't where I wanted to, to go. So I kind of had this, this crisis of well, what am I going to do with my degree? What am I, what am I going to do, um, you know, with my life, I've, I've spent all this time doing this, this degree. And I, I kind of played a bit of a game in my head where I asked myself, okay, well, just anything goes, um, what is, if I could do any job on the planet and it doesn't matter what that job is, um, but it wouldn't actually feel like work. I would just think it was a fun day to get up and just do my thing. And I, I, you know, realized that I had this, you know, this, this love of, um, you know, and really nothing was off the table. Um, and I kept coming back to the fact that I loved reading so much. Um, and I, I devoured all of these novels and I'm like, you know, that would be an amazing job to actually, you know, put stories that are in my head onto paper or onto my laptop and, and do that for a living. Um, you know, and, and sort of use my science degree for for that, to use all my science training for that. And so while I was doing up my, writing up my PhD thesis, um, I sort of had this experiment where part of the time I'd be writing and for fun, just writing fun things. And um, the other, you know, the other part of the time I'd actually be doing the work I was supposed to be doing so that I could graduate. Uh, and so I started off with like an hour of writing, an hour of my PhD thesis, which rapidly became three hours of my fun writing and, um, you know, uh, an hour of my PhD thesis. But by the end of it, I ended up with um, my degree ready to defend. Yay, I got my PhD. But I also had my first novel. So, um, and then the next steps was just doing the experimentation of what do I do next? Well, try and get an agent, try and get it published. Um, and I, I was really lucky. I, I had a lot of luck in that area. Oh yeah, I can say that again, because uh, a lot of authors <laughs> wish they would get their books published by one of them big time houses. And you're probably one of the few on the show of guests that only had this actually had books published by both Random House and Simon and Schuster. So how did that process go along? Was it choosing like the right book agent or wait, did you learn the skill yourself? Like, how did that happen? I, I think I kind of, I, I think I had some really great training during my degree. A lot of a PH, a, a lot of doing any, any kind of PhD, doesn't matter what field you're in, um, but particularly in, in sciences is, you're kind of trained as an expert in problem solving um, because rarely does any experiment that you set out to do ever go the way you think it's going to go. Um, so to survive a PhD thesis, you, you're a PhD program, you, you, you've got to be able to learn and, and be trained to think on your feet. So when I started, um, you know, fi finding an agent is, is a very daunting, daunting task. Um, and my, originally, I didn't actually think, I, I wasn't planning on, on, on successfully finding an agent. I figured that I would send out a hundred query letters and I'd, you know, send it out for about a hundred rejections. And then I would take the novel and try to self-publish it. And so I set off, it sort of set off with that, that number of, I'm, I'm gonna query a hundred agents, we'll see how it goes. But the way I found agents, to query one of the places. Um, so this is back in 2013, 2014, when I was pitching the novel, the way that you, you typically could go and, and pitch to a lot of agents at once was to go to an, uh, a conference um, where you could, you know, pitch to 10 different agents, you know, and, and get feedback on your pitch and, and your novel and maybe get a couple of requests. And I didn't have money to do that kind of um, a conference. I, I was, you know, still in, in grad school at this time. And um, I also didn't want to have to wait eight months for one of these conferences, the local one, to, to come around. Um, so what was available, though, was a list of the agents who were going to be at the sort of the, these conferences 
who were looking for new authors. So um, eight months before the conference even happened, um, I ended up targeting all the agents I could find who were going to these conferences. So in my mind, looking for new, new authors and querying them uh, and, you know, sort of writing personal ones, uh, you know, one tailored to each, each agent. So I do a few each night. Um, and the, the agent that I was successful with was, was one of those agents who was looking for new authors. Um, and she rep, uh, another author whose books I absolutely, another Canadian author whose, um, books I adored, uh, Ian Hamilton's Avalee series. Um, and, um, I, I wrote that in my query letter. I said, you know, I, I love, uh, you know, I love Ian Hamilton's books. And she also really liked things like, uh, she mentioned that she was into dark fantasy, which was me. That was great. Um, urban fantasy, uh, but also pop culture references and stuff. So I'm like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give her a try. Um, she really liked my book and we chatted. I signed on with her and then um, uh, she was able to get it sold to Simon & Schuster a couple months later. So that's how my process worked. But the, the caveat in there is that, you know, no author, no two authors out there have the same pathway to being published, um, being published or successful, whether it's self-published or the traditional route going through an agent. Every single author you talk to is going to have a slightly different way that they 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 got there. So I always like to say that too to to um, aspiring authors that just because it happened one way for one person doesn't mean your journey is going to look anything like it. Oh yeah, I definitely could say that again because it's so darn true. It's like <laughs> here's seven steps for success. Here's the ten steps to greatness. Like three simple. It doesn't phases. exist in writing. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it's it's and, and I you know there there really are some great writing advice books out there. Um, I I always like to to mention Stephen King's on writing. That that is an amazing writing help book that also talks about um you know the career part and I, you know I I think he has some good really really fantastic advice advice out there I don't think I found anybody who thinks um on writing has that has any bad advice in it um but I I get really leery about these ten, yeah like these 10 steps to success and and complete these steps and and you're going to be successful I always kind of find that those tend to be attached to that sort of line of you know pay x number of dollars for our you know, multi steps to success. And um, I, I always try and steer authors away from that. I, one of the best pieces of advice I got from a writer early on in my career was money goes in, in the writing world, money goes one direction towards the author. And at any point in time, if you're being asked for the money to go a different direction, uh, you really got to question and you really got to look into that and say, is this a good idea? Um, I, I, I know a lot of authors who spent thousands and thousands of dollars on conferences, prestigious, you know, writing workshops that are out there in conferences, but there's, there's no guarantee in those that you're going to get to, um, you're going to get a pathway to success. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I can say that again, indeed. Yep, that's right. Because every path is definitely different. That's right. Because not everybody can have a hundred friends hit the pay now button on Amazon for ninety nine cents. It's like it's not gonna happen for everybody the same exact way. Sometimes there may be a pitch of a foot involved. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, it's so darn right, too. And that's uh, kind of another reason why sometimes I uh, try to warn folks or tend to not charge a lot for certain things because, like, there's so many folks out there. Now, granted, there's some great people, too, doing some great things. But, like, sometimes people will charge you two arms and one of your legs because, well, of course, inflation and also the fact of, hey, I got this stuff to learn from somebody else is regurgitated for real. And, It'll do wonders for you, maybe. 
I didn't put the maybe in the contract or the marketing material, but hey, it'll work out for you. It'll be perfect. I'm telling you, it, it, it'll work out just fine. I'll tell you, it, it works exactly the way it happens. Trust me, it works out exactly the same for everybody, no matter age, gender, or genre. That's right. One genre could be urban fantasy. The other genre could be, uh, let's see here, let's go for romance. Like, yeah, it works exactly the same way when, truth be told, it won't. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, with um, with the self-publishing, you know, explosion that's been out there, it's, you know, there there definitely is, and and this is outside my my area, my area of expertise, and I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm 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 always happy to um, happy to put forward my my ignorance on the self-publishing world because it's it's, you know, it's just this huge arena, uh, but there are definitely there are definitely places where you have cover artists um, and uh, you know editors and um, marketing people who can do wonders but yeah it it, it becomes that business at, at, at that point there there it's always struck me that with the self-publishing world there's a real business acumen that comes into it um, and again just just putting out that plan and figuring out what steps you're going to take and and evaluating what steps are going to be right for you um i i know one sci-fi author who's done incredibly well on um, on amazon uh her name escapes me at the moment but she she's done some beautiful space opera uh years back when i was doing a podcast when i was uh co-hosting on a podcast we interviewed her and she had taken her um savings account and um used it to get uh an incredibly um uh beautiful cover for her first novel that she was self-publishing from uh, a very well-known um sci-fi cover artist uh, and it worked out beautifully for her you know and, and she talked about it on the podcast where you know she um i she was saying that uh, you know, at, at, there was that point where she was crossing her fingers and going, "Oh man, maybe I've made a huge mistake here." Um, it, it worked out well for her. She also, you know, when we were talking to her, it can, became really clear that she had done her homework um, before she she set down that that pathway. I, I'm I'm sorry that the name escapes me right now because she was um, she was a wonderful guest, and I I um, uh, remember her talking about her experience in self publishing sci fi. Um, you know, quite fondly. Uh, it wasn't one of our past guests, Catherine Hudson, was it? No, no, um, no. I don't think it was her, but that it, it's it's possible. It's possible, and um, I'm going to kick myself later for not remembering it while I'm on your show. Yeah, happens to the best of us. Happens to the best of us. Say okay, it's a okay. So my goodness, so since you've basically been publishing your work through actual publishers, it's, <laughs> how much work do you feel like you've been doing since then in terms of getting your name out there? Has, have you been receiving some help from the publishing industry, like the companies at all, after they accepted the wonderful knowledge from your agent? Like, how's that been working out for you? So for it, I, I guess there's a bit of um, so really well, like, I mean, I, the, the publishers, uh, my, my experience, you know, with, with the big publishers is that I, I did see quite, um, quite a return from things like um, BookBub, for example, my very first book was on BookBub, and I think it got me like a bestsellers ranking that month. Um, so I, and that was, that was my publisher who got me that. Um, you know, I've also up, up here at least um, in Canada, cold, cold north, although it's not so cold right now, they're heat wave. They were the ones who were getting me on national, um, national radio, um, national news shows. So that, you know, um, and, you know, getting my places, my, getting my books in places like Costco, uh, which, you know, on my own, there, there's even with the best publicists, I don't think I would have been able to do. You know, it's there. There's an interesting disconnect, though. So, having said that, a publisher can do a lot for a book and for a new author. Um, I, I, I like being with the big five. That again, that's been my experience so far. Um, but 
uh, or I guess it's big four now, because I think there's been another merger. They keep merging. Um, I remember it before it was random, random house and penguin, and now it's random penguin. But yeah, like, I mean, they, they can do a lot for you. I think some of the some of, of the issues can come up where if they don't, if, if you happen to be a book where it's not targeted in the right place. So I think some authors go into the, the big, uh, go into a, a publishing deal thinking, great, I'm going to see my book on television being advertised or, you know, on in a magazine or something with a full page in a newspaper. And you know, in, in some instances, depending on what kind of a book you've written and what genre you are and, and who, your, who your publisher thinks the demographic is, that might not be the best place for them to put it um, or to put an advertisement. Um, and, you know, conversely, they sometimes get it wrong. Sometimes they, they can target it. Uh, they think they've got the right audience and they think they've got the right marketing plan. But, you know, there's, there's that point of, of human you know, human error that comes into it. Um, so I think it's kind of that expectations and then you can do your absolute, you, your publisher can do their absolute best, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to see the sales they want or that, you know, that you as the, the author wants. There's a funny disconnect though, when um, it comes to an author over their career. So, um, and, and, and this is something you, you start realizing um, the more books you have come out and, you know, if you have different series, it's no, it used to be back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and before that, that if, say, Simon & Schuster bought your book, your first book, and it did okay, got you on the mid list, earned back its advance, then they were really happy and they want your next book. And they'd want to make sure that they had all your books that you were publishing. That stopped being a thing in, in the 2000s. So there's less of that building up an author and having a staple of, of authors that you publish. And it's more the individual books that you're publishing. So it's not, un, it, it's not uncommon at all for authors to be with Random House, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, um, you know, Bloomsbury, uh, Random Penguin, um, Hache, you can have books with everybody now. And uh, it, it really depends on the book that you've written. So what happens then is that as an author, you might have, um, you, you would sort of think that if you have a book coming out with Random House, then your backlist from Simon & Schuster is gonna start selling. But that's not in Random House's interest because those books aren't in their house. So you see a lot of authors now who are traditionally published um, working with publicists on their own now because their brand as an author and their own, um, you know, uh, their own stable of books that you have personally as an author is not necessarily going to be reflected in the, the sort of stable of books that a particular publisher has. And so you, you know, as an author, you, um, even with the traditionally published authors, uh, especially with the traditionally published authors now, you have to be responsible for that. So um, hopefully that wasn't too rambling and that made sense. It was a sort of a looped way around of explaining it. Ain't nothing wrong with loops. That's how we get some <laughs> shoestrings on our shoes, y'all. I'm telling you, like, ain't nothing wrong with loops because it's solid advice right there especially someone with the big four <laughs> they used to be with the big the big five they ain't got no thumbs no more they just trying to <laughs> this one shy house. <laughs> oh man definitely solid right there and that and it makes perfect sense because like a lot a lot of big time authors nowadays like there's like you think they're with one company not of nowhere you see this whole new imprint under a big five company. It's like, what the heck? Like all this other stuff. And it's like, hey, got to build the whole brand now because they just want the one book now as opposed to your whole freaking collection. Yeah, yeah. And it, it means that because, uh, because for as, as an example, let's take Random Penguin. 
random penguin isn't going to have all of a particular author's books anymore. They're going to be spread out there. And some of them are going to be self-published now too. That's, that's the other thing is, is everybody's doing hybrid. So then, yeah, you as an author, even if you're traditionally published, um, you've got, got, got to be cognizant that whenever you've got a book coming out, you, you want your entire catalog out there, not just that one book. So you've, um, there's, there's, I think everybody's getting a crash course or everybody has been getting a crash course in publicity and marketing over the, uh, the past 10 years. Oh yeah, that's right. Indeed. You could definitely say that again. Because marketing is something that everybody can become better at. Indeed. Yes, indeed. Especially with the business acumen required and with everybody and their mom almost now wanting to be an entrepreneur, sometimes out of curiosity and just wanting to be in chic for lack of a better word, or because of necessity. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's also that, that aspect. I, you know, I know authors who have done, you know, spectacularly well in, um, you know, self-publishing and basically running their own publishing house. Cause when you're self-publishing, it's kind of what you're doing. Um, and they prefer to handle it themselves because they feel they're doing a better job or they can do a better job. And the numbers certainly are, are not proving them wrong um, than the publishing houses can do. And so, you know, they, they would rather do all of that themselves or they've got, you know, um, a family member who just who knows how to do that marketing, um, the marketing and publicity. And it's, it's really opened up the publishing world to, to so many more people, which is, it's a good thing. There's more books out there. Woohoo! That's right. More books for people indeed. That's right. More books indeed. Not to mention the speed requirements or lack of speed <laughs> isn't really an excuse anymore. If you publish it yourself and you do all the marketing yourself because it's like with writing if you're writing 2,000 words a day and you're getting really as you go along if you have that as a habit built in and you got all that darn content out there and you get it edited it's like you don't want to wait around on that for a year because when you're out talking about it and heck even with one of our guests last year Dr. Hardy Benjamin Hardy he was even said in the middle of the interview is like, Hey, I'm, it's kind of interesting talking about this book because this book was done a year ago and I'm just now talking about it. Cause it's now just freaking released. And it's like with the hybrid and doing yeah. it yourself, it's like, ah, I'm, I'm actually living with the content. Now it's fresh in my head. I can actually talk about this character moment a bit without semi spoiling it. Yeah. And you, you can get them out there faster. Like, I mean, it's there, there were authors who can write three good books in a matter of months they might not have the word count that you know that, that authors you know traditionally have have associated with the larger novel but it doesn't matter if the readers are happy with it and are buying it um and and they can deliver those novels on a um you know they can deliver a, a shorter novel um you know on a more regular basis well that serves the author it serves um the, the readers um, and it's, you know, it doesn't, um, uh, it, it, it serves that creativity. It's, um, it's yeah, and, and it's not uncommon for the, if, if you're going the traditional route that you're sitting there for a year, sometimes too, if they decide to change the marketing plan um, with the novel that's already been done. So it's, um, you, you could be sitting there waiting for a while to see what their response is or, or for that novel to come out oh yeah and i'll be pissed i'll be like come on y'all really <laughs> two years damn it i don't I like might have gray hair by then stop it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes indeed yes indeed well, and speaking of years and multiple books you yourself have multiple books and i believe your most recent book is voodoo shanghai so that is one heck of a title apparently it's not even <laughs> the first it's like the third book in a series if i'm not mistaken yes yeah um it's my kincaid strange series and the three books are the voodoo killings um lipstick voodoo and voodoo shanghai and voodoo shanghai is the third one 
Ah, all righty. So what's with the voodoo obsession all of a sudden? Is it because of the name? Like, is it because the character's name is Kincaid Strange, which is a kind of a cool name, if you ask me, to be honest. Thank you. Um, I, I loved the name. I love Kincaid. And um, yeah, I, I just couldn't resist when I originally wrote the novel, I couldn't resist tossing Strange in there. Funny. So this this is another since we're kind of talking about the traditional versus self self publishing a bit. Um, th this is another thing that sort of comes up with um, with the traditional world is that you might not have control over uh, you, you don't have control over the cover also might not have control over the name. So when I originally wrote the book, what, what the series is about is, is Kincaid Strange is, I originally pitched it as a practitioner. So a practitioner living in Seattle with the ghost of a grunge rocker. And what she does as a practitioner is she, uh, you know, talks to ghosts she, um, you know, she talks to ghosts across um, across the other side through mirrors, and um, raises the odd zombie for uh, things like will disputes, and uh, you know, when uh, when a family gets upset that um, you know somebody maybe got the uh, the 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 young mistress got left with all the money, and and kids hire Kincaid Strange because they they want to talk to their dad about that, and. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's it's and, and and that's kind of urban fantasy is you know what would we it, it's kind of the you throw in the supernatural it's like okay what would we really use the supernatural for you know if you really could talk to ghosts and raise a zombie what would we really do you know and and for sure she gets calls for things like you know a beer zombie you know university students want her to raise a zombie but it's got to have you know id because they needed to go get beer and um you know, it's, it's, it's the day to day of how the supernatural gets used. And um, anyway, her, t so she uses, um, when I was writing the novel, she does use things from voodoo. And it made a lot of sense from a, the, the way that, you know, the religious, cultural, spiritual elements of um, voodoo are, are used, have been used, or are still used by people. Is, is that it's, it's kind of a give and take with the spiritual world and the natural world. You're kind of asking it to do things and, and, and trying to, you know, almost in some ways, um, you know, bargain, bargain with your spirits. And, and, and it's almost, it, it's like a, a give and take, like a, like a bit of a, you know, push, push pull with, um, with the natural world and the natural order. And I just thought that fit so well. Um, and, and made a lot of sense for how my character would talk to the spiritual world, how she would use it in spiritual, with the, you know, to, 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 um, communicate with ghosts. And um, I, so I, I, I worked it into the novel um, and, um, but she's not really a voodoo priestess. She, one of her instructors is, um, you know, her, her old time instructor is, is a voodoo, voodoo priest. Uh, and I, I tried to be pretty clear about that with the novel. And the original title was um, was actually um, Dead and Drowned Seattle. I was kind of going for a, um, you know, kind of a take with um, uh, on on movie titles. So instead of Sleepless in Seattle, um, Dead and Drowned Seattle. And my agent sold it to Random House and they said, no, we're not doing that title. And um, they caught on to the voodoo aspect. And they're like, well, how about we work voodoo into the title? And that's how, you know, and we sort of went, to, went back and forth on different titles. And, um, and that's what, that, that, that ended up becoming the theme. Uh, and that kind of gives, I, I, hopefully that gives a bit, a bit of insight on how things work in the publishing world. I'm thrilled with the titles. I, I, I love them. I, I thought they were, were wonderful. I ended up writing the second book to the title. I had the title act for the second and third book. I had the titles before I wrote the novels and they inspired the novels. But if I hadn't have gone with a publisher, it never would have been, the, the voodoo theme probably never would have been there. Oh yeah, definitely. It's not your everyday urban fantasy title either. Like voodoo is something that's really 
talked about or mentioned these days and because most folks don't want to touch it with a freaking 30 foot pole <laughs> after 2020 <laughs> it used to be a 10 foot pole but we had to make it 30 feet with that one and it's like wow voodoo shanghai huh so chinese people and voodoo let me stop <laughs> Actually, no, it's actually not. So, um, so the Shanghai is, um, uh, so Shanghai, so the book takes place, it's actually historical um, term Portland. And um, it refers to being Shanghai. So at the turn of the century, um, one of the things that would happen in Portland is um, you would be, there, there was a route, there was a shipping route and it was Portland to, to Shanghai. And the sail, no sailor wanted to do this route because it took too long. You'd be gone for three years. Um, and you might run out of water, you might run out of food, you might get scurvy. It was, it was just not a place to be. So the ship would, for, would, would dock in Portland and um, everybody would get off. And uh, no, no thank you, I'm not doing that Shanghai run. And so there was, there was this real problem. And, you know, go back to late 1800s, uh, Seattle or Portland. And um, I, I, I like to refer to them as some of the most damnably creative people on, on, on the West Coast. There was a business here that some, some locals noted. And it was that, um, so what would happen is say you're a logger and, or you're somebody, you don't have a lot of family. You come into town, you're, you're a young, young fellow and uh, you go to a bar and you order a beer and you might get to talking to somebody and, and they're sussing you out. And um, the next thing you know, you start feeling sleepy and then the floor drops out from underneath you and you find yourself, either you wake up in a cage and you can still see the cages today where with the logging boots where people would be dropped um, or you might wake up on the ship just wake up on the ship too far away to swim back. Um, and so you had been Shanghai um, onto, the, onto this, this shipping run. And so um, the book takes place in, this particular book takes place in Portland. And um, uh, what Kincaid's doing is ghosts have gone missing and uh, the police don't wanna look for them. And um, she gets hired by the local paranormal community to try and find out where these Shanghai ghosts have, uh, have gone. So that's, that's where that title came from, um, was that historical bit. But, but yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I hope people like the books. <laughs> I hope people enjoy the titles, um, but, uh, but yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, hey, you're still writing it ain't like it's book number one and done, like you've been doing this for years. So folks are liking it. And the beautiful thing about it is it's an audio too, all of them in audio, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, they are. I, I was lucky enough to have these books with um uh to have books picked up with Audible. So they're they're out there too. That's right. So something for both the lazy people and the blind people. I read audiobooks all the time. I love them. They're wonderful if you've got to do stuff around the house or if you've got kids. Okay, so for the lazy, blind, and busy. There we go. There we go. That's right. That's right. Saved you from having to jump across the Zoom screen and choking me out. There we go. That's right. That's right. Be like, turn this host into a kin doll now. <laughs> How dare he forget I am a mom, a busy mom who writes stuff. That's right. It makes things explode. <laughs> oh, man. So since this is far from your first interview, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often? Which, oh, any question that I wish would yeah. ask more often? Anyone? Right. I don't know. I, I wish... Um, I, I, I was actually, I, I was thrilled that you asked about just the process of getting, getting to publish. Cause I, I, I kind of feel like people think it's a, maybe, maybe you've noticed this, but like the media loves a overnight success story. So the, you're writing it on a napkin and then you're JK Rowling. Um, 
you know, or Stephen King or something. And uh, they don't really exist. So I love it when uh, I get to talk about the process because when I was an author, when I was starting out, that was one of the most useful things that came to me was just the process and what to expect and all the different weird, wonderful ways it works. Oh yeah, that's right. That's not the reason why the show is called Going North. We're not metaphorically northy yet. A lot of folks are on the journey, including the host himself, and you gotta take some tips, some techniques, some stories of information to be inspired and informed along the way and realize that hey, success is tangible if you do the work and the preparation. Absolutely. That's right indeed. That's right indeed. Yeah, because list of past couple of interviews and folks having really dive deep into that they're like oh so you're with the big four awesome all right so more about this wonderful book i can buy later but it's like hey there's some missing meat in there like you're missing a whole darn metaphorical turkey here there's a lot of meat in there <laughs> <laughs> oh man so my goodness so what's next for you i'm sure you got some more magical novels cooking somewhere in the head of yours I, I think every author on the planet probably answers that one with yes I've got multiple drafts in the laptop. I, I don't know about um, about you or or you know other authors uh, authors out there listening, but I had a rough time last year focusing. Um, I did lots of drafts. I did lots of different stories and I wrote lots of scenes, but I had a really hard time focusing on finishing anything. Uh, just with everything going going on, with having a kid home, kids home, and um, you know, kids, family, everybody, cats, you know, dogs, everybody in the house constantly. The distractions I, I found really hard to work with. So right now, I'm just trying to finish and focus my way through um, uh, getting my drafts legible. But I'm I'm doing doing a definitely. There's an urban fantasy in there, and then I've got a, a spy spoof I'm working on, and um, a couple of dark mysteries so the goal is to get them get them all done this year and we'll, we'll see if that happens Ooh, that's what i'm talking about right there all right that's right some dark mysteries that's right some spice indeed that's right it might even be vanilla spice <laughs> yes indeed yes indeed my goodness do you think there might be some more genres you might explore outside of the mystery and the urban fantasy I, you know, I think some of the best, some of the absolute best read genres out there. So like, I mean, romance and, and what's kind of, I guess, marketing wise, it's, it's, it's referred to as chiclet. I love those kinds of, um, kinds of stories. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to try, try my hand at it, you know, and, uh, and, and thrillers too. Um, I think it's, I, I think it's good to branch out and, and just try new things. Uh, and if it works great, if not, that's okay too. At least I've tried. Oh yeah, that's right indeed. That's right indeed. But hey, success will happen for you because it sounds like it's something that you actually want to write. Well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed I get something done this year. Oh, you will. You'll get something done this year. Yeah, 2020. Yeah, the Grim Reaper year, a year of multiple distractions where you're trapped indoors and like, hey, I'm trapped with these kids. Crap, I made them. Darn, they're here. Uh, I'm trapped with them. Why do they still have all this energy? Ah, oh, crap. Why do they eat three months of food in three minutes? Darn it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like, uh. There was one point where I was, uh, you know, last year, 2020, every time there was a bit of bad news, you know, it's, um, uh, and this is kind of the dark, I, I guess, sort of that um, the gallows humor that uh, a lot of urban fantasy authors have, but, you know, it would become the, did anybody have X for their apocalypse bingo cards this month? Um, and, oh, yeah, uh, I remember that. <laughs> and it was like, you know, I, I'm getting a lot of apocalypse bingo. This, this is not good. <laughs> was like, you know, space. I think there was space material that came down. Oh yes, the niche um, potential for, for life on Venus. They were finding organic chemicals. And I'm like, I, there, there's, there's just too much apocalypse bingo, bingo happening. So anyway. 
inspiration to somebody's novel out there. That's right. Apocalypse bingo, y'all. That's right. It's like, all right, so this time it's like, all right, who had tornadoes? All right. Yep. That's right. Yep. All right. So who had snow in June? All right, who had it? <laughs> Me. I've been waiting 15 years for this one. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, although I don't think that happened. I was I was really hoping for it though. Yeah, maybe next year. Get some snow in June. Be like, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You think it's summer, but nope. Snowfall. Nature's cocaine pays another visit. That's right indeed. That's right indeed. Well, we're coming down South to Park. the man. South Park had a good joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> wait about what which one? <laughs> oh, i think i i i'll just say this um if, if for, for anybody who's a south park fan um i think it was last year's christmas special it's it's um yeah it it, it was pretty funny so anyway there there was a reference there and in, in um reference to one one of the one of the snow jokes you made there so that's all i'll say <laughs> Oh, nature's cocaine. Okay. All right, cool. Ah, uh, yes. That's right. One of my borderline dad jokes that are disguised as bad puns. Anyway, so we're coming down to the magical question. Oh, that's another fun fact. I didn't even know that you were a South Park fan. This is great. All righty. That's right. She loves Uncharted and she loves South Park. This is great. Yes. Ah, quick. Actually, fun fact. Are you still a gamer? Oh gosh, yes. Yes, I don't have as much time as I used to, um, but absolutely. Do you know what I've been playing? That um, I uh, that that you know, considering I am more of an RPG person, um, is, is kind of hilarious. Stardew Valley. Oh. It's one of these farming games, and it feels like meditation. So I've been playing it through twenty twenty. And every time I turn it on, it's just like, oh, I'm back at this nice little farm. I can grow my beets. I, I can go fishing. And it's um it it, it says something about the year that um, that I, I think it has I think it's been hugely popular. I think a lot of people are playing it. Oh yeah, that's right. That and Animal Crossing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of went like way back and went the final fantasy 15 route and finally jumped on the persona 5 game oh man so many hours disappeared from my life <laughs> <laughs> well they they remastered one of their um i think it was final fantasy was it, some I, I know there's a gamer out there who's, who's just gonna be that i i can't remember which one i think it was final fantasy 6 or 7 they just remastered and i i've been playing it and it's it's beautifully beautifully done um but uh yeah it's it's i'm i'm kind of at that point now where i kind of feel like going back and playing some of the old school i know there's a new dragon age coming out in the future but um i'm i'm actually thinking mass effect is the series i've got to go go back and play the remasters of uh, because they've just redone all of the original games and and fixed some of the things i guess and updated the graphics so i'm i'm anticipating that Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, I know what game you're talking about. Final Fantasy VII. That's right. So sometimes yes. on the PS4. Yep. Yeah. Or are you, were you one of the lucky ones that was able to snag a five? Um. <laughs> we know we play. We've been playing it on the floor. Okay. Okay. Don't be modest. So we don't everything... know your home address. Relax. No. No. <laughs> I, I, I feel bad though, say, you know, I, I, I would feel bad because it's, I, I know there's a lot of people out there who really want one and maybe weren't able to get one. So I, I would never want to say if I did have, have, have one of those gamings. Um, I, 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 I would not disclose that because I don't like to make people feel bad about things that they might really want. And, um, I, but, um, and they're sold out everywhere. Um, like the air conditioners in Vancouver right now, it's um, apparently there are people hanging out in the Best Buy parking lots, um, waiting for the shipment to come in so they can buy one because of the heat right now. But um, uh, yeah, but um, 
with uh, all like I mean I think that one was originally for the PlayStation Four, so I, I've been playing it on the PlayStation Four. Uh, did you play as you yet? No. No. Oh wait, I might have. I might have. Is that earlier in the game or later? It's supposed to be a little bit later. Later. Okay, I think I might be coming up to that. Ah, uh, alrighty, alrighty. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, because that Mass Effect as well, like, funny enough, actually, it's kind of sad. I, <laughs> I, I went back, I know, we're talking about Final Fantasy. Hey, it's, some of the best story writing, though, um, is, is in video games. Like, I mean, oh, I, oh, yeah. I was so, I, I remember how inspired I was for my writing from video games. And I, I still attest that Mass Effect is some of the best science fiction that's been written in the last 10 years. Um, and it's video game format. Um, and Dragon Age 2 is some phenomenal fantasy. Um, the Witcher 3 is another one that, that just gets Slavic storytelling so well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Final Fantasy. I could not, I, I had to go through and play it two more times. I, I, I shamelessly have played through the Walmart section and quests twice. Twice, I think I might be on my third replay through. Because it was yeah. just so well done. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. We're always trying to save some money too, because like, ah, uh, games these days, like, ah, uh, really, like sixty, seventy, really. <laughs> it's like, ah, uh, it's like, man, I'm at this point where I can afford it, but still, <laughs> like, ah, uh, it's like, no, I want to keep my arm. No, you're not charging me another arm for this. I must use the arm to play the game, but this this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yes, indeed. Heck, funny enough, you're right about that too. One of our earlier guests, my God, I think that was episode 19. Beth Martin herself, she uh wrote one of her sci-fi novels based off the Bioshock game. That's a great one to do. Bioshock is another great example of just you know uh, phenomenal science fiction. Oh, yeah, that's right. Some sci-fi ahoy. That's right. Some sci-fi video game pie for novelists and aspiring writers. That's right. That's right. Pick your game. Write your book. Become a legend. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> had, had, had to put the maybe in there. Didn't want to give them a guarantee. You know? Don't want to say the whole... <laughs> build it and they will come thing again like nah <laughs> that's been debunked multiple times <laughs> not everybody gets a field of dreams darn it <laughs> <laughs> maybe a field of broken dreams but <laughs> stop <laughs> oh man well, that was a great side quest. So back to the main quest. Yeah. So we're coming down to the magical question. And every guest gets to receive. And that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time in the year of 2021, with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? In 2021, man, oh man. See, because it, 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 it depends how you interpret that question. Because if you were asking me, if I got to go back from sitting here now, and tell myself, you know, 20, if, I, if I'm telling myself, you know, 20, um, 25 year old me what to do, it, it, the answer of course is by Apple stock Ac across the board. What would I tell 25 year old me to do? Buy Apple stock, but uh, take out the time travel. If I woke up today and I was, you know, 25, 25 again, what would I do? I would do more traveling, even with I, I'd be getting ready to do some more traveling. I think that uh, there's just, there's just, the world is just such a big place and there's just so much out there to see. Oh yeah, definitely say that again. That's right. Might even bring back some travel stories around too when you come back on the podcast. That's right. That's right, indeed. The Christy travels, indeed. The KT stories. That's right. Might even be in the next novel. That's right. That's right. Where she had to fight off a grizzly bear, and the grizzly bear needed help. That's right. That's right. All the help. Yes, indeed. sir. 
our animals of the uh, of of the far north. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right, north of Hope and D. Yes, indeed. But hey, solid advice right there. You're right about that interpretation. <laughs> Probably eighty percent of them <laughs> take they they take the time travel piece of the question, like, oh, twenty five again? Sure, now freaking take over the world yeah 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 and um <laughs> and buy apple stock i'm like no we're, we're not going to the apple stock we're not going back route. yeah <laughs> like, no you're just basically reverse aging like tomorrow you're 25 again <laughs> tell yourself to do something important <laughs> yes yeah it would it would be traveling you know so i was lucky i did do a lot of traveling when i was younger but man i wish i had taken more time you know, it's, uh, I wish I had taken more time and gone more places. And that would be it. Ooh. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Boulder solid advice, y'all. That's what I'm talking about. Take advantage, travel as much as you can. Get some of that paper. That's right. Especially if you ain't got any uh, little ones yet. That's right. That's right. Travel as much as you can. Yeah, it gets ones a lot harder up. once you've got little ones. <laughs> That's right. Coming from a busy mom herself, y'all, it's the truth. It's the truth. That's right. It's in that stew, y'all. It's the truth. That's right. So for those who want to keep in contact with you and buy bunches of copies of all your magical books and tell their friends, their cats, penguins, and dogs about your books, what's the best way for folks to do so? Hey, you know what? I, I like to tell people to check them out at the library. Um, that's That's one of the benefits of being with the big four is um, my books are in, in most libraries. And I love it when people support their local libraries. Um, if you really, really want to find my books elsewhere, it's, um, you know, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon and um, Audible. I'll have them. So, uh, so you can find them there. That's right. You get all the weed brownies for saying support your local library. I'm telling you, that's right. <laughs> that's right. As a day job of being a librarian, I appreciate that. That's right. Get all the brownie points. That's right. You've won the Fort Knox of brownies today. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So the gold bricks is brownie bricks, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So that'll make for a great Fat Man novel somewhere. That's right. He was on a search for the Fort Knox of Brownies. <laughs> a great title for a short story. Oh, uh, yeah. That's right. It's like, I've come for the brownies. Like, what? What, what do you mean brownies? They're, not, they're, they're freaking gold. Like, wait. Oh, my bad. I, I came for the actual brownies. I heard that this place has all the brownies in the world. Like, more than you guys in terms of gold. Like, wait, what? Like, get this kid out of here. Yeah, yeah, but hey, for those who, <laughs> but anyways, before I go any deeper in that rabbit hole, as I occasionally do, any parting words before we close up shop, Christy? Oh, no, this was a ton of fun. Thank you so much for having me, Dom. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast episode. Hope you really enjoyed it. Be sure to subscribe to this show if you haven't already, because more greatness is coming your way. And if you're so inclined, be sure to share with at least three other people in your network, so that way more folks can catch the fire that is on the Going North Podcast. Keep winning at life and advance others to advance yourself.